The story is told of a certain Midwestern town which for many years had prohibited the sale of alcoholic beverages within the city limits. Following the election of some new members, the town council had a change of heart and granted a building permit to a saloon keeper. As his tavern was being constructed, a group of Christians were concerned about this development and publicly protested. They gathered in their local church for an all-night prayer meeting asking God to intervene. The next day, a terrific storm blew through those parts and lightning struck the construction site for the tavern, rendering the incomplete structure a total loss. The saloon keeper brought a lawsuit against the Christians claiming that they were responsible for this financial setback that he had suffered. The Christians, of course, hired their own attorney who argued that no, they were not responsible for what he had undergone in terms of loss and financial devastation. After hearing both sides, the judge finally remarked, no matter how this case turns out, one thing is clear, the tavern owner believes in prayer and the Christians do not. Now, maybe those particular Christians did not believe in prayer. Under the circumstances, they didn't want to have that particular accusation leveled against them in a court of law. But there was one Christian that we know of from the Scriptures who believed ardently in prayer, and that was the Apostle Paul. His life was characterized by prayer. The missionary statesman J. Oswald Sanders says of him, Of all men of all ages, few, if any, have excelled the Apostle Paul in the depth and the effectiveness of their prayer lives. He was at his best in his prayers. In no area of life did he set a more noble and stimulating example for us than this. We must be grateful for the self-revelation and insight into prayer with which his letters are studded. Second Thessalonians is among the shortest of Paul's epistles, yet it features some of the most splendid specimens of apostolic prayer anywhere in Holy Writ. And one of them appears at the end of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. That's where I want us to go in our Bibles at this time. If you don't have your own Bible, use the Pew Bible and to per- turn to page 1843, and there the text will be. It's verses 1 and 11 and 12 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, which in the NIV reads as follows. With this in mind, he's speaking of the return of Christ that he has just described for these believers in verses 6 through 10, with the return of Christ in mind, we constantly pray for you, Thessalonians, that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray that we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. As we examine this passage together now, I want us to take note of three particular truths that stand out here as we join Paul in what the South African pastor, uh, um, Andrew Murray, once called the School of Prayer in one of his outstanding uh, books on this subject, the School of Prayer. What do we learn as we join Paul taking lessons along with him and even from him in the School of Prayer? First of all, we note that Paul had a tremendous commitment to prayer, Paul's commitment to prayer. He was a Christian who quite simply bathed his life and ministry in prayer. Frequent, fervent prayer was a normal, natural part of his daily routine. And you see that, for example, uh, at the beginning of verse 11. With this in mind, what I've just said to you about the second coming of Christ, we constantly pray for you. This was the hallmark of Paul's relationship with his churches and and his converts. He was constantly praying for them. I thank God always concerning you, he wrote the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.4, because I'm always praying for you. To the Ephesians, he declared in Ephesians 1.16, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. In Colossians 1.9, he said to the Colossian brethren, we have not stopped praying for you. Timothy, too, received this assurance from Paul in 2 Timothy 1.3. I constantly remember you, Timothy, in my prayers night and day. Now, does all of this input concerning Paul's prayer life mean that that's all the man did? 
Was he praying nonstop? Actually, literally, always without ceasing praying every single moment of every waking day, going through whatever he was engaged in with his head bowed, his hands piously folded, praying as he went. Obviously not. The real nature of Paul's prayer life, I think, is captured for all of us at the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 when he gives us the command that many of us know by heart in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, you are to pray without ceasing, the King James Version. The more contemporary versions have, pray continually. That phrase, without ceasing, is just one word in the Greek language, the word adialeptos. Dr. Charles Ryrie makes this observation about it. Outside the New Testament, the word is used of a hacking cough and aptly illustrates what Paul has in mind here about prayer. Just as a person with a hacking cough is not always audibly coughing, though the tendency to cough is always there, so the Christian who prays without ceasing is not always praying audibly, yet prayer is always the attitude of his heart and life. And so it was with Paul. He was not always audibly praying, but he had an attitude of prayer in his mind and in his heart that carried him through every single day. God was with him. Him and he practiced the presence of God wherever he was, whatever he was doing. Every day he acknowledged his dependency upon God and yielded his will to God. He brought God into his little world through an internal, ongoing, spirit to spirit conversation, casting on God all of his needs, all of his problems, bringing to God all of his joys, as well as all of his sorrows, and making sure, of course, that God knew about the churches he was shepherding, the converts he was bringing into the family of God, the prospects prospects he hoped to uh, win to Christ. In short, Paul was bringing his whole life to the Lord every single day that he was alive. He was totally committed to prayer because he was totally committed to God. During the trying times, he and his soldiers passed through at Valley Forge back in the days of America's revolutionary war effort against Great Britain. General George Washington often found rest and relief in prayer. One day, a Quaker farmer approaching the camp of the soldiers who were under Washington's leadership heard an earnest voice On coming nearer, he saw Washington himself down on his knees, his cheeks wet with tears, his heart being poured out to God in prayer. The farmer returned home excited and exclaimed to his wife, George Washington will succeed. George Washington will succeed. We Americans will secure our independence. What makes you think this is so, Isaac asked his wife. The farmer replied, because, my dear woman, I was out in the woods today, and I encountered the man, and I heard him praying. And the Lord will hear his prayers. And as a result, Hannah, he will succeed. Rest assured, he will succeed. And of course, he did succeed. The Lord did hear the prayers of George Washington, along with many others, back during that period of time. You and I want our lives and ministries to succeed. Do we not? Of course we do. That goes without answering. Then like George Washington and the Apostle Paul before him, as faithful disciples of the Lord Jesus, we must commit ourselves to prayer. We must understand that apart from the Lord, we can do nothing of eternal value, but that with the Lord and through the Lord, we can do all things that he allows us to accomplish in his name. The English pulpiteer Charles Spurgeon summed it up best in one of his sermons on prayer. The power of prayer can never be overstated, he he stressed. Those who cannot serve God by preaching need not regret. If a man can but pray, he can do anything, for prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscles of omnipotence. Don't you like that line? Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscles of omnipotence. O ye who sigh and languish and mourn your lack of power, hear ye this gentle whisper, could ye not watch one hour? For fruitfulness and blessing there is no royal road. The power for holy service is communion with the Lord. 
Let's move on now from Paul's commitment to prayer to a consideration of his burden in prayer. What did Paul pray about? What did he pray for? What was the burden on his heart as he sought the Lord, as he interceded for others? The second half of verse 11 gives us the answer. Here Paul tells us, Thessalonians, we are constantly praying for you, and here's why we're praying. We want God to count you worthy of, your, of his calling, and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. In other words, as Professor Leon Morris puts it, the prayer of Paul is that the Thessalonians may grow in things spiritual. Paul is asking God's help in making these believers more mature and more fruitful in their Christian walk and witness and service. And what a contrast this is as I thought about it between what Paul prayed for and what you and I as believers today so often pray for. And I'm not criticizing us. Prayer, for whatever reason, is always precious to the Lord if we come to him with the right attitude and motivation. But our focus tends to be, it seems to be, on the external and the temporal, whereas Paul's focus was on the internal and the eternal. We usually ask God to heal ailing bodies and to provide for physical needs. Paul was asking God to build up Christ's body and to manifest his glory through the church, both the church universal and the church local. Bible scholar Arthur Pink states, all the prayers of the apostle may be summarized as requests for supplies of grace that his disciples might be conformed in ever-increasing measure to the blessed image of God's only begotten Son. A devoted children's Sunday school teacher had the joy of leading pupil after pupil, week after week, in her classes to a saving knowledge of Christ. It was remarkable. After she passed, her family found her diary and read what she had written in it, especially to the Lord. It contained, among other inspiring entries, these following pledges, number one, Resolved to pray for each of my pupils by name. Number two, resolved to wrestle in prayer for each of my pupils by name. Number three, resolved to wrestle for each of these pupils by name and then to expect an answer. No wonder she had a, such a tremendous impact upon those children and was so fruitful in her witness and soul winning. Like Paul... She was praying earnestly and energetically for the spiritual welfare and growth of those who were entrusted to her care. According to our text, Paul's fundamental request for the Thessalonians is that the Lord would count them worthy of God's calling. Now, the calling of the believer, quote unquote, is just another way of describing the salvation of the believer. In 2 Thess- Timothy 1.9, Paul speaks of God who has saved us and who has called us with, an ho- with a holy calling. The, ba- the two are basically equated there. God saves us, meaning God has called us with a holy calling. God has called us with a holy calling, meaning that he has saved us. So our calling in Christ is the same thing basically as our salvation in Christ. And something else that Paul makes very clear in epistle after epistle after epistle is that this calling, this gift of salvation comes to us not because of anything that we do to deserve it or to earn it, but because God gives it to us in his grace and love. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2.8. Well, if that's the case, and it surely is, then why would Paul pray that God would count the Thessalonians worthy of his calling? Is he asking that God would somehow enable them to earn or deserve or merit their salvation? Is that what he would say about you and me? That God would somehow enable us to earn or deserve or merit our salvation? Absolutely not. That would run contrary to his entire scheme of theology. 
No, what Paul is seeking from God here is the fulfillment of Ephesians 4.1 in the lives of the Thessalonians. Like the Thessalonians, like the Ephesians, he wants the Thessalonians to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that God has given to them, given to them in his grace as his gift. He wants their practice to conform to their position. He wants their lifestyle to reflect well on their Savior and to commend what he has done for them so that others would be ready to have him do it in their lives as well. The Thessalonians have been called of God to be his children. Now let them act like it as they pass through this world. You are children of the king. You are princes and princesses in the royal family. Now strut through this world with a royal bearing. Even if you are going through persecution there in Thessalonica, even if it is hard for you to be a believer for the Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ, stand apart as someone who is divine property, his possession in a world that is fallen and headed for destruction and death. Paul is crying, oh God, cause the earthly conduct of these believers to correspond to their heavenly calling. The 19th century evangelist Dwight L. Moody was preaching one day on a street corner in the city of Chicago where he lived. A large crowd had gathered to listen to his message. He, after all, was a good speaker, and he was famous by this point in time. When he had finished his presentation, a drunken man came staggering up to the famous minister and announced, Hey, Mr. Moody, do you remember me? I'm one of your converts. No, I don't remember you, replied the startled preacher. But you must be one of my converts because you're definitely not one of the Lord's converts. <laughs> now, maybe that was a little too harsh. It is possible, yes, even for a born-again believer to struggle with the bottle. As a pastor of 52 years, I could bear witness to that. But Moody was on the right track here. He believed, as Paul before him believed, that if you're saved and you know it, then your life should surely show it. You will be a new creature in Christ if you will put your faith in him so that old things have passed away and all things in terms of your relationship with God and other human beings will be new, different, fresh. And in your daily life, in your walk, there will be a consistency between how you talk and how you walk. There will be conduct that corresponds to your calling. An Italian preacher might put it this way. If you don't walk of the walk, then don't talk of the talk. <laughs> Make sure you're the genuine article. And at the verse end of verse 11, Paul describes exactly how it is that the Thessalonians and you and me can count ourselves worthy of the calling that God has bestowed upon us in his grace. It will happen as God fulfills in us every good purpose of theirs, the Thessalonians, and every act prompted by faith. The New American Standard Version renders that request this way. We pray that God will fulfill in you every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. Desires for goodness. Don't you hate the sin that you do? I do. But we yearn for the goodness that God wants to develop within us and display to others around us. That comes from the Holy Spirit. It's one of his fruit. Galatians 5.22. So may God give us as he counts us worthy of his calling, this Holy Spirit power to bring forth every desire within that he plants there for goodness and the work of faith that's generated by our commitment to Christ with power so that others may see the beauty of Jesus in us. Now, how do we do that? How can you and I develop Christ-like goodness, for heaven's sakes? 
It's really quite simple. Get into the good book. Spend time in the Bible. Spend so much time in the Bible, as Spurgeon would say, that your blood is bibbling. (laughs) The more time you spend in the Bible, with a hungry heart, a desire, Lord, make me like the one I'm reading about, the the amazing thing is it's going to begin to happen. You will become like Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. You will develop those desires for goodness and you will manifest more kindness and more love and more gentleness, more sweetness of spirit, more spiritual beauty. When you really get into God's word on a consistent basis for the nourishment of your own soul and the spurring of your spiritual growth in Christ, then you're going to become different than the world around you. Your standards will be different. Your morals will be different. Your values will be different. I read just recently about a missionary who was serving down in Mexico City with an evangelical agency. Mexico City is huge. One of the biggest cities in the world. 10 million people plus. And so this missionary had to go from where he lived in that city by bus every day to the ministry area where he was assigned to work with the native people and help develop a local church. One day, the bus driver gave him far, much, far too much change after he had bought his bus fare. He returned to his seat and was counting up and realized, wow, that bus driver has given me a near fortune. This is not right. So he went up to the bus driver and said, hey, you gave me way too much change. The bus driver smiled at him and said, I know, I did it on purpose. You did it on purpose? Why? Well, you're a gringo, obviously. You don't belong here. I know you're one of those missionaries. You're down here to peddle your religion, and I wanted to see if you really practice what you preach. (laughs) The missionary returned to his seat, praising God that he passed the test. that he didn't let his Lord down by pocketing some money that didn't belong to him. The Apostle Paul would have been proud of that man. Would the Apostle Paul be proud of you, proud of me, because of the spiritual growth that he sees in our lives? We're not going to be perfect, but there should be a consistency. There should be a yearning to move forward in terms of Christ-likeness. There should be a, a welling up within us of these desires for goodness. And then, Lord, help me to take those desires for goodness and translate them into works of faith with power by your indwelling Holy Spirit. What it will require of us is prayer. I constantly pray for you that you might be called, counted worthy of his calling and that you might fulfill those desires for goodness in works of faith with power. The proper way for a man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keys, and the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms and wrapped upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Slow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hand should be serenely clasped in front with both thumbs pointing to the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year I fell in Hodgkin's well head first, said Cyrus Brown, with both my feet a sticking up and head a pointing down. And I made a prayer right then and there, bet the best prayer I ever said, the prayingest prayer I ever prayed, a standing on my head. <laughs> now I'm not recommending that you stand on your head to pray. Because if you dear people go out and try to stand on your head, we're going to have to call the paramedics. You're not going to be able to get up. The neighbors are going to be in a whole state of turmoil. What in the world has she done to herself now? I'm talking about prayer on the inside. Cyrus Brown prayed sincerely. He prayed fervently. 
And the Lord heard his prayers as he heard George Washington's prayers and the Apostle Paul's prayers. May you and I join Paul then in praying that God would unleash his power to help us do all that God, that do all the good things we hope to do and that with faith we want to do. That's 2 Thessalonians 1.11. There's one more point, one more truth I want to extract from this little passage before us today, just a two-verse paragraph, and that has to do with Paul's purpose in prayer. So we've considered Paul's commitment to prayer, Paul's burden in, as he prays, and now what's his purpose? What did he want to see God do as he prayed for the Thessalonians and probably for all other believers along the same line? That's where verse 12 comes into play. We pray this for you folks so that, and that's an expression that designates purpose, whether it's in the Greek or the English. We pray for this purpose that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the best way to comprehend what Paul is praying for here is to zero in on certain key words and elements in this single verse. Take, for example, that expression, the name of our Lord Jesus. What that denotes is not the label that Christ wore. If Jesus came to Grace Bible Church, we'd give him a little name tag, a badge. It would say, Jesus of Nazareth, Grace Bible Church, right? That's a label that he wore, would wear on the outside. That's not the name of Jesus that we're talking about here. Other labels for Jesus on the outside would be rabbi, son of man, messiah. No, we're talking now about the real person. What's on the inside, the character, the personality, the identity, all that he is, all that he does. Think of John 1.12 where the Apostle John said, as many as received him, whether they be Jews or Gentiles, as many as received him, to those human beings, Jesus gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. The name is not the label. Like Bill is my label or pastor is my label. The name is the person. So that's what Paul is saying here. I want the real Jesus to be revealed in you. To come forth in response to my prayer as you grow in the grace and knowledge of your Savior and Lord. You, I want you to be more like him. Another important word that we encounter in this 12th verse is the word glorify. We pray that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. Obviously, this word comes from the root glory. When we speak of the glory of God, what do we mean? We mean of the stuff that makes God God. The glory of God would be the building blocks of deity that make God God. The attributes that make him the distinct supreme being that he is, unlike us, infinite, whereas we are finite. Again, the Apostle John is helpful to us. John chapter 1, once again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, Jesus, was God. Verse 1, verse 14. And we disciples, we apostles, beheld his Glory. After he had become flesh, we beheld his glory. We saw in this human being attributes of God, and it became clear to us that God had visited our planet, that God had wrapped himself in human flesh in this person known as Jesus of Nazareth. And now Paul says, I want those attributes of Jesus that you can share with him, attributes like love and kindness and gentleness and goodness and sweetness of spirit to be manifested in you. I want him to be glorified in you. And here's the amazing thing. As he is glorified in you, as he shows his glory in and through you, you in turn will be glorified in him. 
you will strike other people as being the real deal. You're going to stand out as the princes and princesses in the royal family that you really are. I belong to the king. I'm a prince in his family. I'm a princess in his family. That's why I am the way I am. That's why I think differently than you do and act differently than you do and react to hurts differently than you do and bear my burdens and grief and loss and loneliness and depression differently than you do. We need to show the world that we belong to the king even as the king is busy showing the world that we belong to him. An eminent preacher of a yesteryear closed his Sunday evening sermon with a moving altar call. Many people came forward, including a woman of wealth and social distinction. She asked the minister if she could say a few words to the audience, and he gave her permission. Here's what she had to say. I want you to know just why I came forward tonight. It was not because of any words spoken by this fine preacher. I stand here because of the influence of a little woman who sits here right in front of me. Her fingers are rough with toil. The hard work of many years has stooped her low. She is just a poor, obscure washerwoman who has served in my home for many years. I have never known her to be impatient to speak an unkind word or to do a dishonorable deed. I know of countless little acts of unselfish love that adorn her life, but I must confess with shame that I have openly sneered at her faith and laughed at her love for God. Yet when my little girl was taken away in death, it was this woman who caused me to look beyond the grave and shed my first tears of hope. The sweet magnetism of her life has led me to Christ. I covet the thing that has made her life so beautiful. What she has, I want. That's why I'm standing in front of you this evening. At the request of the minister, the little woman was led forward, her eyes streaming with tears of gladness. Let me introduce you to you, he said to the folks gathered there that evening, the real preacher on this occasion. Whereupon the congregation stand and stood and as one man gave her a rousing round of applause. Not to glorify her in herself, but to glorify the Lord whom she had represented so ably and powerfully in the home of that woman who that very night had come to Christ because of her. Now I submit to you, friends, that that little washerwoman glorified the name of the Lord Jesus in her life, and he in turn glorified her in him. She may have been an obscure and insignificant figure in human terms, but she was a heroine in the halls of heaven. And so also can you and me be the people like that who count not so much in terms of what the world thinks, but in terms of what God thinks. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. And he's concerned about what comes out of that heart. As a Christian, I, I want what Paul is talking about here in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 11 and 12 in my own life. As your pastor, that's what I want for you in each of your lives. I can tell you that my encounter with this text studying it the way I have and applying it not only to you in this message but to myself has been so profoundly convicting. I am a prayerless man. Compared to the Apostle Paul, I'm a spiritual pygmy. But Lord, I want to be different. Even at 77 years old, I still want that freshness. I want that closeness to Christ. I want that kind of correspondence between my calling and my conduct that will bring joy to your heart and fulfillment to me. So make it happen, dear Lord. And do that for the people that I serve and shepherd and love here at Grace Bible Church. And all God's people at Grace Bible Church said, Amen. <laughs> Let it happen. 
Get it on, God. The best way to get it on with God and from God, obviously, is to pray. So since you've heard a message this morning about prayer, seems like the practical application at the end is for us to pray, right? So that's what we're going to do silently in our hearts. You just bring to God whatever has been stirred within your mind, in your heart. Just pour out your inner spirit to him. Cast your cares upon him. Bring your praises to him. Surrender afresh to him. Let's get it on with God for the revival of our own lives, for the revival of Grace Bible Church, and for the impact that Grace Bible Church can have right here in our own community, in our city, our state, and even our country. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us access to yourself, for opening the door, for bidding us come at any time and any place for any reason. We know that we do not come because of any merit or desert that we might lay claim to. We have none. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in your sight, but we come in the name of Jesus. And because of his most excellent person and his finished atoning work and his ongoing intercessory ministry in our behalf, we're here in your presence because of Jesus. So hear our hearts and begin a good work of spiritual deepening and renewal in us. Start with me as the pastor. Do that with my staff my elder board, with this whole congregation. Maybe we become a church that is spiritually vital and dynamic and fruit-bearing and soul-winning right here in Sun City. And may we have an influence that will reverberate all out from us to touch other Christians and churches as well. So fulfill Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians and the Sun Cityans, I pray, dear Lord. And start today, we ask in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.